get this now, that are seemingly dead, amen, somebody, God is able to make it live again. The important thing is, is that we keep our eyes on God. And that no matter how hopeless and dead things seem, we need to obey God at his word. Because God is true to his word and he's faithful to his promises. Amen, somebody. But the question for us this afternoon is, am I a Christian in name only? Am I a Christian in name only? And I want to set this up by just giving you a brief uh, summary or a brief uh, history about the city of Sardis that we learned in our World Video Bible School class when we uh, took the class of Revelation. As we learned uh, that Sardis was a wealthy city. Sardis uh, was a city that enjoyed all kinds of trade in Asia. Uh, however, in AD 17, the city of Sardis was hit by a tremendous earthquake. But it was rebuilt, and it was rebuilt uh, with much help from the emperor at that time. And you can study this on your own in your library and history. Uh, it was helped to be rebuilt by an emperor at that time named Tiberius. The city sat atop a very tall hill, uh, which had steep inclines of about 1,500 feet on all sides. So just imagine a city that's set on the hill with these steep 1,500 feet inclines uh, on all sides. And therefore, as a result of that, they felt very secure. And there's times in life when you and I have certain things. Amen, somebody. We may have a couple dollars in our pockets. Our fridge may be full. full. Our car, our car may be running right, and we get a little bit uh, safe and secure in ourselves. Amen, somebody? So they felt secure from their enemies. However, uh, that didn't stop them from being overtaken two times in history. And they were overtaken because of their lack of vigilance. And the point is this. Laxness, being lax, seems to follow when people are affluent and feel safe in their environment. I don't care where you live, evil exists everywhere. Is that all right? And throughout history, the same has been true in the Lord's church as uh, the attitude of a society are almost always found in the local church. So what will exist in the mind of our society will also exist among us as God's people. And I'm here to tell you that laxness, being lax, has caused, understand what I'm saying, it's caused many of congregations collectively. And then... Christians individually, laxness has caused many a congregation and many a Christian to be overtaken because of a lack of vigilance. In other words, feeling secure, feeling safe in our spirituality when we're really, truly not. And that's why I want to call you briefly this afternoon to Revelation chapter 3 and the verse number 1, where our Lord Jesus Christ himself is still the speaker. He is the one who is speaking to John and what to write. Are y'all getting this? Our Lord is speaking, and he's speaking to the seven churches, but he's speaking to John in particular as to what to write to the seven churches. And don't think for a moment that he's just talking about 
the churches in the sense of the congregations. I understand that that's the context, but we have to take it twofold. It's talking to us as a congregation, but it's also talking to us as Christians individually. Don't miss that. Amen, somebody. Because when we, if you do a, a study of all these churches, we can see uh, ourselves in there as a congregation in many of them, and we can see ourselves individually as Christians in a lot of them. All right? Okay? So if you have Revelation 3 1, say amen. amen. The Word of God says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God. You say, well, what does that mean? This is just the Lord himself saying that I have, I'm the one with all of the Holy Spirit. Seven is a complete number. So he says, I have all the Holy Spirit without measure. And understand when he says, or when the idea is conveyed without measure, it's not, it's not meant that the Holy Spirit is given out or measured out in parts, but it speaks to what the Holy Spirit enables one to do based on the work that they've been ordained to do. Jesus had all the fullness of God in him because of the great work of redemption that he had to do. Amen, somebody. John 3.34 says it like this. For the one, speaking of Jesus, John 3.34 says, for the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives him the spirit without measure. Is that all right? So the spirit worked in Jesus mightily and no, uh, no uh, measures and parts, but he worked in him mightily because of the ordained work Jesus had to do. Amen, somebody. And now the spirit works in us through the word of God. Guess what? For the ordained work that we have to do. Amen, somebody. And then he says, not only has he the seven spirits of God, but he says, and the seven stars. What are the seven stars? This speaks to the angels that he's writing to of the churches, the servants of the churches. But understand this. Jesus is the one who has them in his hand. In other words, the servants of the churches are under the absolute direction and command of the Lord Jesus. Amen, somebody. Halo, this is not our church. This is the Lord's church. And guess what, members? This is not your church. This is the Lord's church. And we're all servants working together to serve and worship and glorify the Most High God. There are no big eyes and no little U's. We're all our unprofitable servants here to serve the one and true living God. Is that all right? So he says, these says, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Notice what he says then. I know your works. Is that what he says? I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So with that, let's just notice two critical points, and we'll allow the lesson to be ours. Point number one is, again, he says, I know your works. Whatever you and I try to do before people is one thing, but truly understand this. God knows our works. Amen. And I'm not just talking about what we do, but why we do it. The intents, the motivations. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 to 14, we know it. When all has been heard. The conclusion of the matter is this, fear God and keep his commandments. But notice this, because this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring, notice, every work into judgment, including every secret thing, notice, 
whether good or evil. So even if I'm doing things that are good, that glorify God, I don't have to tell you. And you don't have to tell me. Jesus said, do your alms in secret. Amen, somebody. We do things to be seen of men. We're doing them for the wrong reason. And we have our reward already. Because we just wanted someone to know so they can pat us on the back and all that. And it's not about that. It's about God's glory. It's not for any selfish ambition or vainglory on our part. Amen, somebody. And therefore, notice, this speaks, and this is why he says in verse 2, he says, I know your works. But then in verse 2, he says, I have not found your works perfect or complete before God. So what are we speaking to? This speaks to a congregation or individual Christian who is doing plenty of things, but nothing was reaching its full biblical and spiritual fulfillment. Are y'all getting this? In other words, it's uh, a congregation or, it, or a Christian whose fruit is not occurring to their credit eternally. You and I could be busy doing a lot of things. That doesn't mean that it's going to our credit eternally. I can be out handing out book bags. I can be out uh, giving out food and doing all these so-called good things. But are they the things that God has ordained for me to be doing? Amen, somebody. And this is why our Lord himself said in John 15 in the verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What is he saying? He, is he saying that we can't do uh, no earthly good? No, he's not saying that. He's saying apart from me, you can do nothing spiritually that's going to abound to your credit. Amen, somebody. I can be a benefit to people in the world all day long. Amen, somebody. But I'm, am I truly a benefit to bear fruit for God? And I can't be so preoccupied and focus on doing good to help out men and not be busy about God's business. Amen. To glorify him and to help somebody's soul. So whatever we do as a congregation, whatever we do individually as Christians, has to ultimately be about saving souls. Is that all right? Notice Philippians 4.17, Paul says, not that I seek the gift itself, but I do seek the fruit which abounds to your heavenly account, the blessings which is accumulating for you. And then Titus comes right back, and uh, Paul comes right back in Titus 3, 14, and says, and our people, speaking about Christians, our people must also learn to devote, vote the, to devote themselves to good works in order to meet the pressing needs of others so that they will not be, notice, unfruitful. Unfruitful. So the question is, just how critical are you and my works of obedience unto the Lord? Now, I want you all to get this now. We're almost done. I want you to notice how critical you and my works of obedience. Okay? Our works of obedience. What do you mean by that? There is no works of merit that can cause us to inherit eternal life. We can't merit it on our own. We're saved by grace through faith. Amen, somebody. None of us can work our way into heaven. We're not good enough. But we do have works of obedience that God has ordained that we should walk in. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, notice this, to do good works. Now, what's the good works? Which God ordained beforehand that we should do. Those things that God ordained for us to do. Those are the good works we're talking about. 
Titus 3.8 says this, this is a faithful saying, and these things I would affirm constantly that those who have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Amen, somebody. It's important for you and I to make sure that we maintain good works, the good works that God has foreordained for us to walk in. Faith without works is dead. Amen, somebody. Now notice this, just to finish it up, about how critical your and my works of obedience unto the Lord is, all right? Just not just here to have faith, we're here to work to be about our Father's business. Revelation 20 and the verses 12 and 13 says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Did y'all get that? The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Notice, and each person was judged according to their works. Works are important. And we're talking about the works of obedience unto God, which demonstrates and proves and gives evidence to our faith. It's not enough for you and I to just have faith. We have to have some works of obedience that shows our faith. Is that all right? And then finally, notice back in Revelation 3, verse number 1. Our Lord says again, I know your works, that you have a name. Is that what he says? That you have a name that you are what? Alive. You have a name that you are alive. What does this mean? It talks about vigorous spiritual life, bringing forth good fruit. You have a name that you're spiritual and that you're bringing forth good fruit, but you are dead. What does this dead mean? It means unable. It means ineffective when it comes to bearing fruit. It means dead. It means powerless. It means unresponsible, unresponsive to the word of God and to God's influence. It means inoperative to the life-given influence and opportunities and things of God. All right? But notice what name here refers to. It's talking about the fact Jesus is saying, you have a name that you are alive. You have character, fame, reputation. You have a reputation that you are alive. But that's opposed to the reality and truth of who you truly are. And again, I bet the question we're asking tonight, am I a Christian in name only? Am I a Christian just because people think I have a reputation of being a Christian or being spiritual? Or us as a congregation collectively, oh, the boulevard, they do a lot. But is that the truth? Is that reality? All right? And therefore, spiritually, this speaks specifically to the congregation or individual Christian who, looking at them, many would say they're very much alive. But the reality and truth is that there's no real spiritual life in them at all. In other words, Christians in name only. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to just be a Christian in name only. And this is why the Lord said in Revelation 3, 17 and 18 later on to the church at Laodicea, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know, you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich 
and white garments that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Have you ever engaged with someone who think they all that and they just don't know? And you praying to God, I, I wish they can look in the mirror and really see how they look. I'll look this way. Uh, ooh, you like this? What I, uh. And you don't want to hurt their feelings. You don't want to be insensitive. Amen, somebody? But sometimes we can think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And we need to be careful. Amen, somebody? Titus 1, 15 and 16 says this. Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure. But nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. Notice, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. Did y'all get that? They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. Then in 2 Timothy 3, 5, the word of God says, they will act religious but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Another translation says like this, even though they will make a show of being religious, their religion won't be real. And we don't want to be that. And this is why we close with Jesus' instructions in verse number two. He says, be watchful, wake up, be attentive, Vigilant, walk circumspectly is what it means. And strengthen, what does that mean? To stand firm, to firmly secure, to establish, to solidly plant one's mind resolutely in a certain direction, which eliminates us from vacillating back and forth. He's saying strengthen, make up, wake up, and make up your mind. Not just wake up, but make up your mind. Stop vacillating back and forth, all right? This week, we want to serve God. Next week, we're serving the world. We take turns holding hands of, of God and holding hands of the enemy. You can't serve two masters. Wake up and make up your mind before you're completely gone. He says, be watchful, strengthen the things which remain, get this, that are ready to die. And what he means by that is the things that you're about to throw away. Understand that God has secured salvation for us. The only way we lose it is if we throw it away by trying to straddle the fence. So he says, wake up. Strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. Why? For I've not found your works perfect or complete before God. Now here's the problem. While our works before men may seem perfect and acceptable, it's not to men to whom you and I will give an account. Did y'all get that? We're so worried about looking spiritual before people when it's not people that we will ultimately give an account to. There's no one in this congregation that you and I will stand before in the day of judgment. We're going to stand before God. Amen, somebody. So let's get rid of this attitude of I got to make sure that I'm on my best behavior around y'all and that y'all think I'm something and somebody. No, because you're not going to answer to me and I'm not going to answer to you. God sees everything. And it's to him that we give an account. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 13, nothing in all creation is hid from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid naked before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And sometimes we don't think, we think we're getting away with something because the consequences have, haven't come. And you have to understand that all consequences God ain't going to give to us in this life. But whatever you get away with it in this life, you sure won't get away with it in the next. But then it will be too late. 
then it will be too late. Amen, somebody. You see, our Lord Christ Jesus is looking for something from us. Get this now as we close. He's looking for something from us. Just as we regard him as the one to whom we look for, for his strength, for his help, for his support, for his comfort, do we not? Amen, somebody. We must never forget that in turn that he's also looking for our love, our obedience, our humility, our loyalty, our service unto him. And this is why he closes and says, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Remember the truth. Any part of repentance starts with remembering that I got to go back, get away from my own stinking thinking and go back to the truth. And when I go back to the truth, notice what he says. Remember how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Hold to this and repent. Because far too often as Christians, uh, we act and behave as if the church belongs to us. But the church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're just all unworthy and unprofitable servants. Amen, somebody. Then he finishes and says, therefore, if you will not watch or if you will not wake up, if you don't wake up, if you don't make up your mind, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. I don't know about you, but I was just talking to Murph about this. The last person I want to come upon me as a thief is the Lord Christ Jesus. No heads up. No warning. Just that's it. Just like the man who was building bigger barns. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And God said, you fool, this night your soul will be required. And none of us know, as healthy and as good as we feel, none of us knows if tonight will be the night. Is tonight the night? Or do we take it for granted that we're going to see each other next week? If tonight is the night, ask yourself this. Are you ready to meet your maker? If you're not ready, you better get ready. William said, stay ready so that you will be ready. Because you can't get ready on the other side. It'll be too late. We've said enough. You can come having heard the word. Do you believe it? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you believe it, are you willing to repent? Confess the name of Jesus Christ and then in obedience be buried in baptism for the remission of your sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And for those of us who have obeyed the gospel, who have been added to the body of Christ, ask yourself, am I a Christian in name only? God is so good that even if I have been in pre pretense in many ways of my life, in other words, some ways in my life, He's still not willing that any should perish. As long as I have breath and you have breath in our bodies, there's still an opportunity to change and to get it right. Does that mean that we're going to be sinless? Does that, that mean we're going to be everything right and perfect? No. But we have to be striving. Because God has been too good. He's given his only begotten son. God has been too good to us. Let's stop allowing ourselves to be so preoccupied with this world and all of this foolishness, and let's focus on what's important, and that's our soul salvation. Amen. Consider where you are. Good brother Sam is saying the words of encouragement. Uh, say, uh, to him.
Thank you, God, for delivering your message to us through your servant, Mark Par Parker. We have these responses. We have one from Chris Beckham. I ask a prayer for every church of Christ around the world, for my family and business ventures, for tonight I trust God in every situation. For Ezekiel, as he starts pre-K on Tuesday, all praise to the Most High God. Amen. And for Sister Sherry Walker, Asking for prayers that God bless my family members and those that are with them with traveling grace. 